Hello everyone, this is Mekunze. I'm going to do 50 um, tests about my health and safety because so I got a new contract. So uh, um, I'm required to do CSCS health and safety tests. So uh, please subscribe my channel. Subscribe my channel, please make it big mm, so that we'll do some things live. I'm gonna start shooting videos with my drone. With my drone, I want us to go live on viewing the whole England. So, you need to make my channel on TikTok big, Instagram, Facebook. So, subscribe my channel. I got a lot of videos to post. So, right now, right now. I'm gonna do this 50 tests. Watch it and see how it goes. I hope I've, I've passed the 50. Let's go, let's go. Okay. So I'm gonna be reading the questions out while I pick the right answer. So this is the question construction certification question. It's still um question one to fifty. You are called to be interviewed by health and safety executive inspector after witnessing a serious accident on site. What should you do? One, tell the inspector what your workmates have told you to say to cooperate and tell the inspector exactly what you saw three or C do not tell the inspector anything D get answer from your supervisor on what you should say in the interview I think B is the answer cooperate and tell the inspector exactly what you saw so let's go to the next one. Next. So it's going to be a 50, 50 questions. So this one is the second one. It's in an emergency, what should you do? Follow the site emergency procedure. B. Leave the site until you think the emergency has been resolved. Call home to tell family. D. Call health and safety executive and ask them what you should do. So I feel it's A. Follow the site emergency procedure. Because the, ask, the question is, in an emergency, what should you do? So the answer is follow the site emergency procedure, which is A. So let's go to the next one. This is the third one. A scaffold collapsed and you saw it happened. What should you say about the accident? A. Tell them who is to blame and what should be done. B. Exactly what you saw. C. Nothing. Nothing. You know nothing about scaffolding. So have no insight or d nothing you don't want to get workmate into trouble i think the answer is b exactly what tell them exactly what you saw so we'll go to the fourth question the biggest cause of long-term health issue in the construction industry is what is a exposure exposure to loud noises breathing in hazardous dust and fumes being hit by heavy vehicle tripping over so the the question is the biggest causes of long-term health issues in construction industry is <coughs> i feel is b breathing in hazardous dust and fumes I think it's B.
So number five, if you have to use a power tool to cut or grind something on site, why has the dust got to be collected and not allowed to get into the air? Most dust can be harmful if breathed in, which is A. B, you don't need a machine guide. C, it will save time later clearing up the mess. D, if the dust is collected, the power to will be slower. So the question is, if you if you have to use a power tool to cut to cut or grind something on site why has the dust got to be collected and not allowed to get into the air so a say most dust can be harmful if breathed in you don't need a machine guide it will save time later clearing of the mess. If dust is collected, the power to go slower. So the answer I feel is A. Most dust can be harmful if breathed in. So go to the next. So number six. The work you have been asked to do is likely to create dust. What should you do? A. Do not... Do not do the work. Dust is highly dangerous. B. Use equipment and tools to eliminate or reduce the dust and ensure that you wear the correct personal protective equipment, PPE, while doing the work. C. Just start work. Nothing is, nothing is required because dust does not cause serious harm or injury. injury. D start start but do not start but do the work in short burst. I feel um say the the question is the work you have been asked to do is likely to create dust. What should you do? So I feel it's um B use equipment and tools to eliminate and reduce the dust and ensure that you wear the correct personal protective equipment PP while doing the work. So I feel it's B. So we'll go to seven, seven after out of fifty. You say what what should you do to reduce trip and injuries resulting from untidy lead? and a station cable in your working area. Say, so what should you do to reduce trip and injuries resulting from untidy lead and extension cable in your working area? Keep A, keep all trailing cable and lead close to the wall and above head height over the top of doorway and walkway, that's A. B. Use the thinner 230 volt extension cable. C. Tie them up into a, sm a smaller square possible. D. Only use cable that have not been used before. So my, my answer is A. Keep all trailing cables and lead close to the wall and above head height over the top of doorways and walkway. So we'll go to number eight. Say so you need to walk near an electric cable and you can you can see bare wires. What should you do? A touch the cable to see if it is live. B just push the cable out of the way and walk around it. C if there if there are no spark, it's okay. To start to walk, D. Tell your supervisor and keep well away. The answer is D. Tell your supervisor and keep well away. Number nine. What do you need to do if you have to run an electric cable across an area used by vehicle? <coughs> Question. What do you need to do? 
if you have to run have to run an electric cable across an area used by vehicle a cover it with scaffold board cover the cable with a protective ramp and put up a sign that says ramp ahead run the cable at head height put yellow tape around the cable so that driver can see it so the question is what do you need to do if you have to run an electric cable across an area used by a vehicle so i feel the answer is b cover the cable with protective ramp and put up a sign that says ramp ahead So go down one. So number ten, which of the following statement regarding environmental law is true? Companies and employees can be prosecuted if they do not follow the law. Only companies will be prosecuted. B. Only company will be prosecuted if they do not follow the law. C. Only company director will be prosecuted if they do not follow the law. D. Only employee will be prosecuted if they do not follow the law. So the question is which of the following statements regarding environmental law is true? I think the answer is A. Companies and employee can be prosecuted if they do not follow the law. So. Um, 11. Question 11. What two action will help minimize waste on site? A. Always take much more than required and use new material at the beginning of each day. B. Leave bag of cement and plaster out in the rain and always take much more than required just in case you need it. C. Only take or open what you need and return or reseal anything left over and reuse and, and reuse of cut such as half bricks as far as possible rather than discarding them d use new material at the beginning of each day and leave bag of cement and plaster out in the rain unprotected so the question is what two actions will help minimize waste on site so um i'm going to take the c only take or open what you need and return or reseal anything left over and reuse off cut such as half bricks as far as possible rather than discarding them so you were asked to pick two um so this one says a it says always take much more than required and use new material at the beginning of each day leave bag of cement and plaster out in the rain and always take much more than required just in case you need it leaving it outside the rain is not good then use new material at the beginning of each day and leave bag of cement and plaster out in the rain so no so you say i'm gonna take this to oh i'll say what to what to action okay so this one is the the c only take take or open what you need and return or receive anything left over so c i took c as the answer so number 12 what activity is good is not good practice on site? What activity is not good practice on site? A. Burning waste. Being careful when refueling plants or power tools to avoid spill. Safely storing materials. Switching off plants and power tools when it is not in use. 
So what a question is what activity is not good practice on site? A burning waste. So question 13. 13. The question is you need to get into and out of a deep excavation. What is the safest way of doing this? Question you need to get a you get you need to get into and out of a deep excavation what is the safest way of doing this a climb down the side b jump in an excavator bucket and get them to to place you down use a fixed staircase jump down and climb up the side Said question you need to get into into and out of a deep excavation. What is the safest way of doing this? Climb down the staircase the, climb down the side. B jump in an excavator bucket and get them to place you down. So um, use a fixed staircase. A fixed staircase. Jump down and climb up the side. So it's between B and C. <coughs> Sorry, the question that you need to get in into and out of a deep excavation. What is the safest way of the, the safest way of doing this? Is use a fixed staircase because you're going to be going in you're going to be going out or jump in an excavator bucket and get them to place you down so i'm going to take i'm going to take use a fixed staircase fourteen out of fifty you see the side support move you see the side supports move when you are walking in an excavation what should you do if you see this happening go and walk a go and walk in a different part of the excavation b keep an eye out to see if they move again c make sure that you and others get out quickly D do nothing. So you see the question say you see the side support move when you are working in an excavation. What should you do if you see this happening? So that's I see make sure that you and other others get out quickly. So go to 15. Guide rays guide rays around the top of an excavation are there to stop a people falling into train trench and being injured b toxic gases entering the trench c the side collapsing d rainwater running into the trench <coughs> So the answer is A. Side rail around the top of an excavation are there to stop people falling into the trench and being injured. So 16, question 16. You have not been trained to use fire extinguisher and a large fire has been reported. What should you do? Head straight over to the fire assembly point. B. Leave the site and go home. C. Put all your tools away and then go to the assembly point. D. Go to the site office to tell them that you are going home. So the question is, you have not been trained to use fire extinguisher and a large fire has been reported. What should you do? So the answer is A, head straight over to the fire assembly point. 
So question 17, how can you stop a fire hazard happening? A, by keeping your work area tidy and put away, put any waste in the bin provided. B, by putting your PPE and clothes over heater at the end of your shift. C, by making sure all equipment is placed by exit route. D, by storing solvent and paint somewhere warm like the drying room. So the question is, how can you stop a fire hazard happening? I think the answer is A, by keeping your work area tidy and put any waste in the bin provided. So this is question 18. You need to walk in a corridor that is a fire escape route. What must be checked? A, that the door at either end of the corridor is locked. B, that you use pack proof tools to get the job done. C, that you remove all fire escape and safety signs. D, that your tools and equipment do not block the route. You say, question is what you need to walk in a corridor that is a fire escape route what must be checked so the answer is d okay no question is <coughs> you need to walk in a corridor that is a fire escape route what must be checked so you need to check something so the answer should be a that the doors at at either end of the corridor are locked No, no. You, so the question is, you need to walk in a corridor that is a fire escape route. What must be checked? That the doors at either end of the corridor are locked. And D, that is A, and D say that your tools and equipment do not block the route. I think it's D. Uh, um, question 19 is saying, where will you find out information about the emergency assembly point on site? Question is, where will you find out information about the emergency assembly point on site? A, on the method statement. B, on the risk assessment. C, on the permit to work. D, during, during site induction. D. Number 20. How will you find out about what to do in an emergency? How will you find out? A. By phoning the local hospital. B. By contacting the health and safety executive. C. By attending the site induction and reading the notice board on site. D by asking a co-worker in the canteen. The question is how will you find out about what to do in an emergency? What question how will you find out about what to do in an emergency? A by phoning a local hospital, B by contacting health and safety executive, by attending the site induction and reading the notice board on site by asking a co-worker so it's c question is how will you find out about what to do in emergency by question the answer is c by attending the site induction and reading the notice board on site question 21 where are i wash bottle expected to be provided a on all sides where people could get something in their eyes b only on site that are situated indoors c only on demolition sites d only on site that are situated outdoor so i think it's a 
on all sides where people could get something in their eyes. So question 22, what people or person is responsible for reporting any unsafe condition on sites? What people or person what people or person is responsible for reporting any unsafe condition on site? Every, A. Everyone on site is responsible for reporting any unsafe condition. B. Only health and safety executive inspectors. C. Only the site supervisor. D. Only the site manager. I think the answer is A. Everyone on site is responsible for reporting any unsafe condition. So 23, question 23, the work of another contractor is affecting your safety. What should you do? A, go and sit in your van until they have finished. B, stop work and talk to the contractor. C, go and tell the contractor supervisor. D, stop work and speak to your supervisor. So the question is, the work of another contractor is affecting your safety. What should you do? The, the answer is D. Stop work and speak to your supervisor. Question 24. The equipment you are using is used with a prohibited notice. What does it mean? A. Only management can use it. Take B. Take extra care when using it. C. Wait until your supervisor is present so you can use it. D. You must not use it until it is made safe. D. So the question is the equipment you are using is issued with a prohibition notice what does it mean so I, I i answer d you must not use it until it is made safe question 25 of 50 where might where might you find asbestos a nowhere nowhere nowadays as asbestos have now be removed from all building. B. In a building built between 1940 and 1995. In any building built or refurbished before the year 2000. Only in factories built between 1925 and 1980. So this one say, where might you find asbestos? This one A uh, say nowhere, nowhere nowadays as asbestos has now been removed from all buildings. B in a building built between 1940 and 1995. C in any building built or refurbished before the year 2000. Think C. Where might you find asbestos in any building? C. In any building built or refurbished before built. In any building built or refurbished before 2000. So I'm going to take that one. Question 26. How is asbestos properly identified? A. By getting a sample and analyzed in a lab. B. By putting it in water to see if it, is, if it dissolves. C. By the color. D. By the smell. How is asbestos properly identified? Um, a by getting a sample analyzed in a lab. 
question 27 if you breathe in asbestos dust what illness can you develop each a itching muscle b headache c lung disease d painful joints i think it's d if you breathe in asbestos dust what illness can you develop I think lung disease D. Question 28. When are male and female workers allowed to use the same toilet facility on the construction site? A. If there are no ladies and gent signs. B. If the cubicle are partitioned from the urinary. D. If the toilet is in a lockable room and partitioned from any urinary. D. Not in any circumstances. Separate facility must always be provided. So the question is, when are male and female workers allowed to use the same toilet facility on the construction site? I think the, the answer is D, not in any circumstances. Separate facility must always be provided. Question 29. What are the conditions for unisex shower on site that can be used by males and females? So what are the conditions for unisex shower on site that can be used by males and females? If cubicles are separated <coughs> by partition, A, then B, if they are in a lockable room for use by one person at a time c if they are in a separate cubicle d not in any circumstances separate male and female facility must always be provided i think is this is d Number 30, question 30. The toilets on site are consistently dirty or do not flush. What should you do? A. Go to a nearby calf, cafe or pub. B. Tell the person in charge of the site about the problem. C. Don't use the toilet while you are at work. D. Have a go at fixing the fault yourself. So the question the toilet on site are consistently dirty or do not flush. What should what should you do? As I think the answer is B. Tell the person in charge of the site about the problem. Question 31. Why should you adopt safe manual handling methods? A. You will be able to lift heavier goods. B. It get the job done quicker. C. It will make you stronger. D. You can protect your back and reduce the risk of injury. Question is, why should you adopt safe manual handling methods? A, you will be able to lift. So the question is, why should you adopt a safe manual handling method? So you'll be able to lift heavier loads. B, you get the job done quicker. 
C, it will make you stronger. D, you can protect your back and reduce risk of injury. So I'll take D. Question 32. You need to use a wheelbarrow to move a heavy load. Is this manual handling? Give one answer. You need to use a wheelbarrow to move a heavy load. Is this manual handling? Give one answer. No. The wheelbarrow, hey, the wheelbarrow is carrying the load. B. Only if it slips off the wheelbarrow and I have to pick it up. C. Yes, pushing and pulling activity are considered manual handling. D. Only if the wheelbarrow is pulled instead of push. Say, so, question you need to use a wheelbarrow to move a heavy load. Is this manual handling? <coughs> Give one answer. Say yes. Which is say yes. Pushing and pulling activities are considered manual handling. Question 33. Why should you ensure that safe manual handling techniques are used in the workplace? Question, why should you ensure that safe manual handling techniques are used in the workplace? A, in case there is a safety inspection. B, to get the job done as quickly as possible to prevent personal injury. Just D, just to meet the client safety requirements. Question is, why should you ensure that safe manual handling techniques are used in the workplace? I think the, the answer is C, to prevent personal injury. Question 34. Can you reverse the damage by exposure to noise over a long period? A, no, the damage is permanent. B, yes, if you have a, a, a quiet job afterward. C, yes. An operation will fix it. D. Yes. It goes away with time. The question is, can you revise damage by exposure to noise over a long period? <coughs> the answer is no. Question, can you revise the damage? It say damage by exposure to noise over a long period. No, the damage is permanent. Yeah, B, yes, if you have a quiet job afterward, no, damage has been done. C, yes, an operation will fix it. No, um, yes, it goes away with time. So I think the, the answer is A, no, the damage is permanent. Um, question 35. Um, how can noise affect your health? A. It causes dizziness. B. It causes an infection in your ear. C. It can cause both permanent and temporary hearing loss. D. It will give you waxy ear. I think it's C. It can cause both permanent and temporary hearing loss. Question 36. After working with noisy equipment, you have a ringing sound in your ear. What does this mean? A. Your hearing protection was working properly. B. It must have been because of the vibration c your hearing has been temporarily damaged d the noise level was high but it is it will be okay so the question is after working with a noisy equipment you have a ringing sound in your ear 
what does this mean a your hearing protection was working properly b it must have been because of the vibration c your hearing has been temporarily damaged d the noise level was high but it will be okay i think the answer is c after working with a noisy equipment you have a, a ringing sound in your ear what does this mean your hearing has been temporarily damaged after working with a noisy equipment you have a ringing sound in your <coughs> what does this mean your hearing protection is working fine no it must have been because of the vibration your hearing has been temporarily damaged yeah question 37 when do you need to wear eye protection on site? A. If there is a risk of eye injury and if it is the site rules. B. When it is sunny outside. C. Only when you walk with toxic or corrosive chemical. D. You do not need to wear eye protection at any time on site. So I think the answer is A. Question is, when do you need to wear eye protection on site? A. If there is a risk of eye injury and if it is the site rules. So, question 38. Safety footwear with protective midsole, midsole protect you from A. Twisting your ankle ligaments. B. Nail a sharp object punch puncturing the sole of your foot if you stand on them see spillage that could burn the sole of your foot d getting your feet wet so question is safety footwear with a protective mist so protect you from twisting your ankle ligament which is a b nail a sharp object puncturing the sole of your foot if you stand on them C spillage that could burn the sole of your foot. D getting your feet wet. So I think the answer is A. So the question is safety footwear with a protective milk milk mild mild sole protect you from nails, sharp objects, puncturing the sole of your foot. Question 39. If you are using a cartridge operated tool or compressed gas tool, such as a nail gun, what type of eye protection do you need to wear? A. Impact resistant goggle. B. Light eye protection. C. Nothing. D. Regular prescription glasses. I think it's A. I impact resistant goggles. Question 40. What does this sign mean? Cover your bare arms, which is A, then B, do nothing. It only applies to managers. C, safety gloves must be worn. D, you must carry safety gloves at all times. I think it's, it's C. Safety gloves must be worn. Question 41. What does this sign mean? Dispose A. Dispose of use vest. Yeah. B. Vest do not need to be worn. C. High vest clothing must be worn. D. Wear white clothes at night. I think uh, answer is C. High vest clothing must be worn. Question 42 or 50. What does this sign mean? A. 
be careful of sleep and trip hazard b no dirty footwear past this point c safety boot or safety shoe must be worn d d wear your wellington boot then c safety boot or safety shoe must be worn question 43 what are the men condition for being able to operate plants on site question what are the main condition for being able to operate plant on site a you must be authorized trained and competent b you must be over 18 years old and hold a full driving license c you must hold a british passport and be over 18 years old C. D. You must hold a full driving license and hold a British passport. Question is what are the main conditions for being able to operate plants on site? I think answer is A. You must be authorized, trained and competent. Question 44 or 50. Where will you be told about the site traffic rules? A health, and a health and safety executive inspector will tell you when they visit. B reading a notice board. C during the site induction. D they, they probably aren't any side traffic rules. So the question is where will you be told about the side traffic rules? as I see during the site induction question 45 a side vehicle is most likely to injure pedestrian when a its horn is isn't working b lifting material up into tall building c revising d it tipping aggregates the question is a side vehicle is more likely to injure pedestrian when a its horn is not working b lifting material up in total building c revising or d it tipping aggregate <coughs> see a side vehicle is more likely to injure pedestrian when it's revising So when this one is not working, lifting material up into top building, revising. So the side vehicle is more likely to injure, it's more likely a pedestrian when it's revising. The question is not seeing it back. So 46, question 46 or 50. You feel that a tax walking at height is unsafe what should you do a get some different work equipment b keep walking and talk to your supervisor when you see them d stop walking immediately and report it to your supervisor d go home and don't tell anyone so the question is you feel that it a tax walking at height is unsafe what should you do so the answer is c stop walking immediately and report it to your supervisor <coughs> question 47 what is the main regulation that controls the use of suitable access equipment for walking at height question what is the main regulation that controls the use of suitable access equipment for walking at height? A. HSG333 Health and Safety in Roof Walk. B. Lifting Operation and Lifting Equipment Regulation. C. Walk at Height Regulation. D. Workplace. Health and safety and welfare regulation. 
So the question is, what is the main regulation that controls the use of suitable access equipment for working at height? I think lifting operation at regular working at high regulation workplace and safety welfare this one's a little bit tricky say question is what is the main regulation that controls the use of suitable access equipment for working at height a hs Health and safety, G33, health and safety, in roof work. B, lifting operation and lifting equipment regulation. What is the main regulation of control? Using suitable access, access, access equipment in working at height. So lifting operation and lifting equipment regulation. Work at height regulation. Workplace set and safety welfare regulation. What is the question? What is the main regulation that controls the use of suitable access equipment? What is the main regulation that controls the use of suitable access equipment? So it's an equipment working at height. So at height regulation. Lifting operations and lifting equipment regulation. I think I'll, I'll go with B. A says it's written health and safety in roof work, suitable equipment for working at height, work at height regulation, lifting operations and lifting equipment regulation. So what is the main regulation that controls the use of suitable access equipment? Lifting operations and lifting equipment. I'm not too sure about this one. I might fail this one. What is the main regulation that controls the use of suitable access equipment? For working at height. So the regulation of working at height. So it's going to work at height regulation. What is the regulation of working at height? Lifting operation and lifting equipment regulation. You know, I think it's working at height regulation. So what is the main regulation that controls the use of... What is the main regulation that controls the use of suitable access equipment? For working at height. So what is the main regulation that controls the use of suitable access equipment? So the, you want to use equipment. What is the regulation of the access equipment? So work at height regulation. Regulation. Lifting operations and lifting equipment regulation. Working at uh, lifting operation and lifting equipment. <laughs> this is tricky. What is the main regulation that controls the use of suitable access equipment for working at height? They all, they all look. I think B and C is lifting operation and lifting equipment regulation. Working at height regulation. What is the main regulation? What is the main regulation that controls it controls the use of suitable access equipment for working at height? So it's going to be working at height regulation. B said. So what is the main regulation that controls the use of suitable access equipment? What is the main regulation that controls the use of suit? suitable access equipment for working at height lifting operation lifting equipment regulation let me go with the working at height regulation i might fail this one 48 what are your responsibility when working at height a 
climb up the outside of the scaffolding the ensure you are sufficiently trained and make use of access equipment c don't listen to the safety briefing given by a supervisor d throw things to your colleagues below question is what are your res responsibility when working at heights climb up climb up the outside of the scaffolding no b ensure you are sufficiently trained and make use of access equipment 49 select which is the correct way to clean up oil that has leaked from machinery into the ground mix mix the soil up with other soil so that the oil cannot be seen b put the oily soil into a separate container for collection as hazardous waste b c put the oily soil into the general waste kept d wash the oil away with water and detergent <coughs> so the question is select which is the correct way to clean up oil that has leaked from machinery onto the ground mix the soil up mix the soil up with other soil so that the oil cannot be seen so select which which is the correct way to clean up oil that has leaked into leaked from machinery into the ground mix the soil up mix the soil up with other soil so that the oil cannot be seen b put the oily soil into a separate container for for collection as as others waste c put the oily soil into a general waste skip d wash the oil wash the oil away with water and detergent mm. so say so, so question select which is which is the correct way to clean up oil that has leaked from machinery into the ground into the ground <coughs> so select which is the correct way to clean up oil to clean up oil that has leaked from a machinery into the ground machinery so this is like inside a building so wash the oil away with water and detergent Question 50. Select the best describe. Select the, the best describes how workers should treat dust. A. Assume dust is not safe wherever they are working. B. Assume dust is safe if they are working outdoor. C. Assume dust is safe if they don't feel any ill effects. D. Assume dust is safe unless told otherwise. Select question. Select the best describe how workers should treat dust. Assume dust is not safe wherever they are working. That's the answer. Always assume that it's not safe. Question is select what best describe how workers should treat dust as if i should treat dust a say assume dust is not safe wherever they are working b assume dust is safe if they are working at door no c assume dust is safe if they don't feel any 
ill effect the assume dust is safe unless the unless told otherwise no so answer is a assume dust is not safe wherever they are walking so i'll finish my 50 questions let me play this okay you've answered all the questions in this module if you're happy with your answers please click submit to see how you got on if you'd like to review any element of the module again, please feel free to go back through the course or click review to go back through the questions. So, let's say I should submit my... So would you like to go back and review your answer for the, this module or submit them now and see your score? Let's submit. Let's submit. That concludes this course. Thank you very much for your time and effort in completing this training. You can obtain your well-earned certificate by clicking on the button below. Very well done and congratulations. If you'd like further information on where to go for further training and support, please use the contact details on this page. Wow, I see what he said, yeah? <clears throat> he said, module content review you have answered 47 questions correctly for a score of 94 percent so i fail only three <laughs> this is a what what should you call this a a a star is a triple star i got 94 percent so you've answered 47 questions correctly for a score of 94%. That is a triple A star. So let's go next. Welcome to this online training course, which is made up of a number of modules. Each module contains a series of videos followed by some multiple choice questions. You can choose the module you wish to study by clicking on the subject name from the list below. It's recommended that you work through the modules in order, as this provides a logical progression to your learning, and you can review the video content as many times as you need before submitting your answers. If you need to break off at any point, that's okay. When you come back, you'll be able to pick up from the end of the last completed module. You get three attempts at achieving the required pass mark on each module before you'll need to give us a call. So go on, click on a module heading from the list below and let's get started. This is big, Jesus Christ. Wow. Okay, let's see. Um, preparation for CIPB enter safety test. So let's go to this one. Open. Welcome to your CITB touchscreen test refresher course. The course is made up of 16 modules, followed by 50 multiple choice questions. The questions are similar to those you will encounter during the touchscreen test, so this is a great chance to get familiar with this style of assessment. You can go back through the modules in this course as many times as you like, and you can even go back to them at any point during the test if you come across a question you're unsure about. Module 1 covers general responsibilities, and these are the main points you need to know. The first thing to do when you arrive on site is to make sure the site team knows you are there. A site induction should be attended by everyone new to the site as it details health and safety rules, including fire and emergency procedures and the location of fire exits and assembly points. Employers must provide workers with instructions in an easily understood format. If something said during site induction isn't clear, ask the presenter to explain it again so you understand. When working on a site, you will be issued Personal Protective Equipment, PPE. If an item of PPE, such as the safety helmet you're using, is damaged, you should replace it immediately. 
Everyone on site is responsible for reporting any unsafe conditions they find. All workers have legal duties to protect themselves and their colleagues as outlined in the Health and Safety at Work Act. After induction, you may be asked to attend further training sessions. These can include toolbox talks. A toolbox talk is a short training session on a particular safety topic. Whilst working on site, you will come across various documents such as method statements, risk assessments and permits to work. A method statement outlines how a job should be carried out. If a job can't be done as described in the method statement, don't start work until you've contacted your supervisor. A risk assessment will identify the hazards and safe ways of doing the job. A hazard is anything at work that could harm you. A permit to work indicates that specific jobs should be carried out under more strictly controlled safety conditions. If a job needs a permit to work, you must not start work until it's been issued. If you suspect the safety rules in your site induction are outdated, contact your supervisor immediately. If you notice that something can't be built as drawn on the plans, contact your supervisor before starting work. Changes should only be made when approved in writing. Similarly, if something on the drawings does not make sense when you are practically carrying out the work, you should inform your supervisor. The site manager is ultimately responsible for managing health and safety on construction sites. If another contractor's work is affecting your safety, stop work and contact your supervisor. Keep your work area clean and tidy to reduce the risk of slips, trips and falls. Sites are sometimes visited by health and safety executive inspectors to ensure all work is being carried out safely. If they find any problems, they can issue an improvement notice or a prohibition notice. If a prohibition notice applies to the whole site, stop work as the site's unsafe. Please click next to continue. Welcome to your CITB Touchscreen Test Refresher course. The course is made up of 16 modules, followed by 50 multiple choice questions. The questions are similar to those you will encounter during the touchscreen test, so this is a great chance to get familiar. Welcome to view the video content again, but this module has no questions, so you have already completed okay, I've already completed this. So on the, so on the second one. Welcome to Module 2, which covers accident reporting and recording. Here are the points you need to know. Details of any accidents or the injuries sustained on site should always be recorded in the accident book by the injured person or someone acting on their behalf. If you're injured at work and the details are recorded in the accident book, they must be treated as confidential under data protection laws. If an accident at work causes a worker to take more than seven days off work, the accident must be recorded in the accident book and your employer must inform the Health and Safety Executive, HSE. Reporting accidents is a legal requirement, so if you witness one, you should report the incident immediately or if you're involved in providing first aid as soon as possible. If you witnessed a serious on-site incident, you must tell your supervisor exactly what happened so this can be appropriately recorded. An incident that nearly resulted in injury or damage is described as a near miss and should be reported as such. Even minor injuries such as a small cut obtained while working on site must be reported and first aid administered if necessary. Accident investigations aim to discover how and why things went wrong and to prevent similar accidents or incidents happening again. When driving vehicles on site, you should reverse with the assistance of a vehicle marshaller. You should always obey site speed restrictions. And if you witness another operator driving plant equipment faster than site speed limits, it's your responsibility to inform your supervisor. Finally, you should never report to work if you're under the influence of alcohol or drugs and anyone found to be should be reported to the supervisor or site manager who will order them off-site immediately. Please click next to continue.
Welcome to Module 3, which covers the main facts you need to know when it comes to first aid and emergency procedures on site. To learn what to do in an emergency, including the location of emergency assembly points, attend the site induction and read on-site notice boards. At the most basic level, your employer must provide a first aid box and ensure there are an appropriate number <coughs> of trained first aiders on site. Additionally, eye wash bottles should be provided on all sites where people could get something in their eyes. On-site first aid boxes should never contain tablets and medicines, and a first aider cannot give you medication without special authorization. If you find that anything is missing from the first aid box, then you should report it to the person responsible. If you are interested in becoming a first aider, you should ask to attend a first aid course. With that in mind, we have covered the basic actions you could take if you encounter some of the most common situations you might witness on site. However, this information is not sufficient to consider yourself competent in first aid, and in all situations, your first action should be to ensure trained help is on the way to assist the casualty. If you find an injured person, the first thing to do is to check you are not also in danger before checking the injured person. If someone gets grit in their eye, hold the eye open and flush it with sterilized water or eye wash. If someone gets a large splinter in their hand, make sure they get first aid. If someone burns their hand, the best action is to put the hand into cold water or under a cold running tap. If you cut your finger and it won't stop bleeding, find a first aider or get other medical help. If you think someone has broken their leg, send for the first aider or get other help. If you have no first aid training and someone is knocked unconscious, send for medical help. If a co-worker has fallen and has no feeling in their legs, ensure they stay still and don't move them until medical help arrives. If someone is in contact with a live cable, switch off the power if it is safe to do so and call for emergency help before doing anything else. If someone collapses with stomach pain and there is no first aid on site, get someone to call the emergency services. If someone is trapped in a deep hole, Shout to raise the alarm, as a trained rescue team will be needed. Whatever the situation, if there is an emergency on site, you must follow the site emergency procedures as laid out in the emergency plan. Please click Next to continue. Welcome to Module 4, which will cover the key points you need to know <coughs> concerning personal protective equipment, often referred to as PPE. Firstly, your employer must provide and pay for any PPE you need on site. Depending on your role, this will be either 3 or 5 point protection. 3 point PPE includes hard hats, safety boots and high vis jackets. 5 point protection usually adds eye protection and safety gloves to this. Always wear head protection on site, except in safe areas such as the office or canteen. If you drop your helmet from height onto a hard surface, stop work and get a new one. Wear safety footwear on site at all times. Safety footwear protects you from punctures if you stand on sharp objects, and from heavy objects if they fall onto your feet. You must wear eye protection on site if there is a risk of eye injury, or if included in the site rules. You should wear impact-resistant goggles if there is a risk of materials flying into your eyes. This is particularly true when using a cartridge-operated tool or a compressed gas tool, such as a nail gun. You should also wear impact-resistant goggles or a full face shield if using a grinder, cut-off saw, cartridge tool or nail gun. Wear safety gloves when instructed to by the risk assessment, method statement or site rules. Ensure you have the correct type of gloves for the job. Another type of PPE you may need to wear on site is hearing protection. Hearing protection includes earplugs, ear defenders, earmuffs and semi-insert canal caps. A specific risk assessment and noise survey are required to determine whether personal ear protectors are required and enforced in the workplace. If you are using disposable earplugs and they keep falling out, stop work until you can get more suitable ones and are shown how to fit them. 
If you have to shout to make yourself heard, stop work and raise the problem with your supervisor. If you are required to work at height, you should be provided with a harness and provided with instruction on how to fit it. If you're asked to wear a full body harness for the first time, make sure you ask for expert advice or training. If your PPE becomes damaged, you should stop what you are doing until it is replaced. High visibility clothing should be replaced if it becomes soiled or damaged. Your employer should supply you with waterproof clothing if you have to work outdoors. Keeping warm and dry means you're less likely to get muscle strains. Risk assessments or method statements should tell you precisely what PPE you need or the task you are performing. Please click next to continue. Welcome to module five, which covers the key information you need to know about environmental awareness and waste control. Everyone on site has responsibility for minimizing the amount of waste created. Companies and employees can be prosecuted if they do not follow environmental law. On-site waste should be collected in segregated skips. This is generally the most cost-effective method as it can be reused or recycled more easily. You can minimize waste by only taking what you need, returning or resealing anything left over and reusing offcuts such as half bricks. It's also worth noting that the amount of resources necessary for a job should be carefully estimated, as overordering materials can create waste. Mixing all waste into the same skin or burning waste is bad practice. Please click next to continue. Welcome to module 6, which covers the key points you should know relating to dust and fumes. The most significant cause of long-term health issues in the construction industry is breathing in hazardous dust and fumes. You must use equipment and tools to eliminate or reduce dust by fitting a dust extractor to the power tool or wet cutting. When wet cutting, ensure the water flow is correct before starting work. You should also ensure that you wear the correct personal protective equipment, PPE, particularly when drilling, cutting, sanding or grinding in a small room. Whatever you are doing, you should always assume dust is not safe. This is because the chances of suffering from lung cancer are increased by breathing in dust. When sweeping up after drilling, cutting, sanding or grinding, dampen down the area and if indoors, open any windows and put on your dust mask. If the water you're using to control dust runs out, you should stop work and refill it. When using a dust extractor or wet cutting, wear an FFP3 rated dust mask, hearing protection and impact goggles. If your work causes dust or hazardous fumes, do not start until you have the correct respiratory protective equipment, RPE. If you require special respiratory protective equipment to handle a chemical, make sure you get the right training. Employers must supply RPE free of charge when needed. Regular RPE face fit tests should be carried out by a competent person as required by law. This ensures full protection for the user, especially if they have facial hair. When wearing RPE, make sure it has a good seal. If your RPE is a bad fit, it will not protect you. The seal between RPE and the worker's face is most likely to be affected by beard growth and wearing safety goggles. Ideally, operatives should be clean shaven when using a half mask respirator. However, where this is not possible for religious reasons, a specific risk assessment of the task should be taken and alternative RPE provided where appropriate. The amount and type of hazardous substances in the air determines the type of RPE to be used for a job. For example, there are different filter types such as dust and particle filters, or gas and vapor filters. A particle filter is suitable for use when dust and fibers are in the air. Contaminated RPE should be disposed of and be considered as hazardous waste. Please click next to continue.
Welcome to Module 7, which covers the main facts you need to know relating to noise and vibration. Excessive noise affects your health as it can cause permanent and temporary hearing loss. Temporary hearing damage can be caused if you have been working with noisy equipment. <coughs> the early signs of noise damaging your hearing are temporary deafness or ringing noise in your ears. If you think work noise has caused hearing damage, ask your employer or doctor to arrange a hearing test. To protect yourself, you must wear the correct hearing protection at all times when working in a hearing protection zone. If someone nearby is using noisy equipment and you have no hearing protection, you must leave the area until you have the correct personal protective equipment, PPE. Wearing ear defenders and earplugs reduces noise levels to an acceptable level. If you notice your ear defenders are damaged or one of your ear pads is missing, do not work in noisy areas until it is replaced. To insert disposable earplugs, you need to roll them up and insert them as far as you can, while pulling the top of your ear up to open your ear canal. Hearing damage is not the only problem that can be caused by excessive noise. If noise levels reach a level where you have to shout to be heard when a co-worker is standing two meters away, then this can have further health and safety concerns. Please click next to continue. Welcome to Module 8, where we'll be covering the key points relating to health and welfare on site. When the site is being set up, provision should be made for a rest area, hand washing facilities, toilets and showers. The on-site rest area should be covered and have tables, chairs and facilities to heat water and food. The legal minimum on-site hand washing facilities include hot and cold water soap and a way to dry your hands. If there is nowhere to wash your hands, tell your supervisor. If you have dirty hands, clean them with soap and water. Never use white spirit or other solvents as they could strip the protective oils from your skin. On-site toilets should be kept clean and in a good state of repair. If you find that they are dirty or do not flush, you should tell your supervisor. If an on-site toilet is in a lockable room and partitioned from any urinals, male and female workers can use the same toilet. It's also worth noting that male and female workers can use unisex shower facilities on site as long as the showers are in a lockable room and can only be used by one person at a time. Please click next to continue. Two of the most common causes of stress at work are lack of job security and fear of redundancy. Employers have a duty to protect employees from stress at work. One of the ways that physical stress of a job can be reduced is by job rotation and task variation. This also helps to maintain high levels of job satisfaction, which will further reduce stress at work. If a worker feels stressed, they should address the issue as soon as possible. You should speak to a person you trust, like a friend or someone independent. Beyond this, a good way to cope with stress is to get enough rest. If work overload is causing stress, you should speak openly and regularly with your manager or employer about the problem. Workers who are being stressed by the actions of a line manager should follow company procedures to address it. If you start to find you are unable to deal with normal workloads, this can be an indicator of stress. Stress can and will be different for each individual. That being said, you should be aware that sometimes repetitive, monotonous work can lead to fatigue, which can also slow down the rate at which you work. Please click next to continue.
Welcome to Module 9, which covers the key points you should know about manual handling. Manual handling involves pushing, pulling, lowering and lifting. Safe manual handling techniques should be used on site to prevent injuries, particularly back injuries. This is because your back is most likely to be injured if you lift heavy loads. If you have any back problems, make sure your supervisor knows. Everyone has a duty under the manual handling regulations to follow their employer's safe systems of work. You and your supervisor or employer should create the safe system of work. If you have to lift a heavy load, your employer must do a risk assessment. Before lifting a heavy load, you should consider if there is a way to avoid manually lifting, which could involve using a trolley or other handling aid. If you have to carry a load down a steep slope, assess whether it can be done safely. If you are working alone and you have to move a load that's too heavy for you, don't move it until you've found a safe method. If you need to move a load that is so big you can't see in front of you, ask someone to help carry the load in a way that allows both to see ahead. The correct method to lift a load from the floor is with your feet slightly apart, one leg slightly forward and knees bent. If you have to twist or turn your body when you lift and place a load, the weight you can safely lift will be less than usual. If you lift a load that is heavier on one side than the other, lift it with the heavy side towards you. You can minimize the risk of injury by using lifting aids. Finally, if a wheel comes off a trolley or you encounter any other issues with the lifting aid you are using, you must find another way to move the load. Please click next to continue. Welcome to Module 10, Safety Warning Signs. In this section, we will show you a selection of the common safety signs you will see on site. This sign means you must wear hearing protection. This sign means you must wear safety eye protection. This sign means safety boots or safety shoes must be worn. This sign means safety gloves must be worn. This sign means high-vis clothing must be worn. This sign means safety helmets must be worn. This sign means safety overalls must be worn. Round, red and white signs are prohibition signs, meaning you must not do something. This sign means no smoking. This sign means no pedestrians or entry for people on foot. This sign means do not access the scaffold because it is incomplete or not safe. This sign means there is no escape route. This sign means the use of mobile devices is not permitted. Green and white signs are safe condition signs, giving you information. This sign tells you where to assemble in case of an emergency. This sign means emergency first aid shower. This sign means an escape route or emergency exit is to the right. This sign means first aid. Yellow and black signs are warning signs, alerting you of hazards or danger. This sign means risk of electrocution. This sign means warning, substance or contents are flammable, can catch fire easily. This sign means warning, laser beams. This sign means emergency eye wash station. This sign means industrial vehicles are moving about. This sign means fire extinguishers and firefighting equipment kept here. This sign means fire alarm call point. This sign means fire hose reel located here. That brings us to the end of this section on safety warning signs. Please click next to continue. Welcome to Module 11, which covers the key things you need to know when it comes to fire prevention and control. Fire needs three things to start and continue. Heat, fuel 
and oxygen. Poor housekeeping, build-up of waste and uncontrolled hot works are common fire risks on construction sites. Additionally, if working in a corridor that is a fire escape route, always check before starting work that the route is not blocked. If your job needs a hot work permit, you will need to have a fire extinguisher close at hand and check for signs of fire when you stop work. The primary purpose of fire extinguishers is to tackle small fires to prevent them from becoming bigger. Even then, you should only attempt to use a fire extinguisher if you have been trained to do so. If a fire is reported, you should always go straight to the assembly point and follow the fire warden's instructions. The first thing to do if you discover a fire is to raise the alarm. Further safety advice. Anyone working alone on site may be asked to make regular radio or mobile phone contact to ensure they're safe and well. If a worker needs a flammable liquid, they should only take enough to carry out the job. If you need to use a liquefied petroleum gas LPG cylinder, you should check to see if there is frost on or around the valve. If there is, this is a sign the valve is leaking and you should report this straight away. Refueling. If a driver is refueling, but there is diesel spilling onto the ground, tell the driver immediately and fetch the spill kit. If a worker spills a large quantity of petrol on their clothes when refueling, they must change their clothes immediately. If a worker spills a large quantity of petrol when refueling, they should follow the stop, contain, notify procedure. Please click next to continue. Welcome to Module 12, which will cover the key facts relating to electrical safety, tools and equipment. Slips, trips and falls are among the most common causes of injury on construction sites. To reduce trips and injuries, keep all cables and leads close to the wall and run them over the top of doorways. Before using an extension cable, uncoil it and check the cable and connectors for damage. If an extension cable has any damage in its outer cover, report the fault immediately and make sure no one else uses it. Similarly, if you notice a cable with bare wires, tell your supervisor and keep well away. If you need to run an electrical cable across an area used by vehicles, cover the cable with a protective ramp and put up a sign that says ramp ahead. Hand tools should always be checked before use. Do not use any chisel or bolster with a mushroomed head, as it could shatter and send fragments flying. If the head of your hammer becomes loose, stop work and get it repaired or replaced. Before you use a cartridge-operated tool, you must be fully trained, as they operate like a gun and can be dangerous in inexperienced hands. If someone is using an insulated pick to break up a surface, never stand in front of, behind or too close to the worker with the pick. A rotating laser level does not present a health hazard to either the user or their workmates. Before using a power tool, you must be trained and competent in its operation. Do not use a power tool if the guard is missing. If your power tool has a rotating blade, adjust the guard to expose the blade just enough to let you do the job. However, before adjusting an electric power tool, switch it off and remove the plug from the socket. Always unplug a power tool when you are not using it. If your electrical tool cuts out, switch off the power and look for signs of damage. The portable appliance testing pack label you find on a power tool will say when the tool was last tested. Battery powered tools are safer than electrical power tools as they are much less likely to give you an electric shock. However, never leave batteries loose in your tool bag because of the terminal short out, they could cause a fire. 110 volts is the safe voltage for electrical equipment on building sites. A 110 volt power cable and connector is identified by the color yellow. If you do need to work with 230 volt tools, then it's important to use a residual current device, RCD, as it quickly cuts off the power if there is a fault. You should avoid working near overhead power lines. It is only safe to work close to an overhead power line when the power is switched off. 
Finally, a few quick notes about abrasive wheels. An abrasive wheel has a recommended top speed. It's dangerous to run an abrasive wheel faster than its recommended top speed, as it could shatter into many pieces. Guards on cutting and grinding machines and tools are designed to stop flying fragments and to stop the operator coming into contact with the blade or wheel. Please click next to continue. Welcome to Module 13, which covers what you need to know in relation to site transport safety and lifting operations. Vehicle striking pedestrians is one of the most common causes of serious injury on construction sites. With this in mind, we will go over some of the key safety information relating to site transport in this section. Firstly, you will be told about the site traffic rules during the site induction. Operators moving plant or machinery on site should comply with speed signs and speed humps. If you see a vehicle being driven too fast, keep out of its way, then report it. When you leave a vehicle, mobile equipment always turn the engine off. Other drivers may accidentally operate levers while climbing into or out of the vehicle. Also, idling engines waste fuel and money. You must not operate plant on site unless you are authorised, trained and competent to do so. There should always be barriers between traffic and pedestrian routes. One of the key ways you can avoid on-site accidents with vehicles and mobile plants is by sticking to the designated pedestrian routes. If you see mobile plant using a designated pedestrian route, report it to your supervisor. Site transport can drive along pedestrian routes only when absolutely necessary, and all pedestrians must be excluded from the route during this time. If your route is blocked by a forklift truck lifting materials, wait or go around. Never walk under a raised load. A mobile plant operator can only let people ride in or on the machine if it is designed to carry passengers and has a designated seat. A site vehicle is most likely to injure pedestrians while reversing. This means you must not walk behind a lorry or mobile plant when it is reversing, as the driver probably won't know you're there. If there are blind spots while using plant but work needs to continue, a vehicle marshal should be used. A vehicle marshal is a recognised control measure when a vehicle is being reversed. A vehicle marshaller must know how to signal vehicles and all relevant safety procedures. If a driver loses sight of their vehicle marshal, they should stop immediately. Finally, if you need to say something to someone operating mobile plant, make sure they can see you and the plant has stopped operating. Please click next to continue. Welcome to Module 14, which briefly covers some of the key things you need to know about working at height. Working at height means working at any height that will cause an injury if you fell. There are no set measurements. This being the case, it also includes working at ground level next to a trench or other earthworks that you could fall into. Falls from height are responsible for the most construction worker deaths each year, so it is vital that you understand the risks and safety precautions you must take. If you feel a working at height task or scaffolding structure is unsafe, stop working immediately and report it to your supervisor who should investigate. Work at height regulations state that you can use a ladder if you are doing light, low risk work for a short time. To support this, it is recommended that the maximum time someone should work from a step ladder in one position is 30 minutes. If you are tasked with using a ladder, you should check it over before you use. It is your responsibility to complete pre-use checks on ladders or other equipment used for working at height. If a ladder is damaged, don't use it. Tell your supervisor and make sure your workmates know about the problem. Ladders should never be painted, as this could hide defects or damage. The best way of making a ladder safe and avoiding slipping is to secure it at the top. 
If you need to use the ladder to get to a scaffold platform, it must be tied and extend one meter above the platform. When climbing a ladder, you should have three points of contact with the ladder at all times. And always remember,